John, the book of John, is unlike uh, the first three books of the Bible, uh, the Christian Bible, the Christian text that is, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these three books are often considered the synoptic gospels, which just means that they have a particular shared theological historical set of events that are told from a particular vantage point. How many of you know whenever you tell a story, whenever you recall a memory, there's always your version, there's their version, and then there's the truth? Well, the Synoptic Gospels have Matthew's version, speaking as a Jew. Mark is the version of the Gospel that <clears throat> is the earliest written and recorded version, but coming through the eyes of Peter through the Roman particular uh, lens. And then Luke is the uh, last of the Synoptic Three Gospels that it written, and it is usually coming through the eyes of a Greek uh, worldview. So you have the same story being told from the perspective of a Jewish person, from the perspective of a Roman person, and from the perspective of a Greek. All of these particular texts share the same stories with particular emphasis, but when you come to the book of John, you have the story of Jesus' life and his ministry told through the eyes and the lens of the one who Scripture describes as the beloved, the closest, one of the closest disciples of Jesus. And what is so powerful about this particular uh, account of the gospel is that it gives to us a very uh, theological and philosophical rendering of what it means that God came to dwell among us. And if you read throughout the book of John, what you find over and over again is that the life of Jesus is one that is consistently attempting to demonstrate with great clarity that no matter what the circumstances are where Jesus shows up, Jesus always has a mastery over the circumstances where Jesus shows up. That Jesus is always at home among the most adverse circumstances. That Jesus is not someone who is surprised by the human experiences of the text or of the people, but Jesus finds Jesus' self at home. And this continuous thing is powerfully described and articulated through the first chapter as uh, what some would call the pre-incarnate expression of Jesus known as the Word. And so we're going to read these first 14 verses as our text for Christmas Eve Sunday, uh, acknowledging that we are about to go down a theological rabbit hole this morning. Amen. But I think it's cool to appreciate that uh, for many of us, we know during the time of Christmas and Easter, there's always lots of ink and production uh, created on TV to try and, uh, you know, convince us, did Jesus really come? And is this some kind of contrived story by some Europeans bent on world domination? And uh, the job of the preacher on Christmas is to give you all the facts to convince you that this is not a conspiracy theory. Well, go to my sermon last year, praise God, and you can get that message. But I believe today, given all the things that are happening in the world, more than a, a apologetic or a defense of the historicity of these important events, I believe we need more than facts to help us make sense of what's happening in the world. Dare I say that even though you may know a lot of facts, about what's happening in your life. How many of you know that 
Sometimes you appreciate when a miracle happens. Something you can't fully explain, but you know is real. That I can have all the facts, but there are some times where I just need God to do something that blows my mind. Any minds need to be blown today. Amen. And so this text is intended to try and help us take hold of the miraculous. The, the rules-breaking, mind-bending activity of God that has been happening since the beginning of everything that was created, and in particular, during this time of Christmas, this season of Advent, we are now laying hold to this truth that God, if my life is like those who are living under the rubble, whether it's in Palestine or Oakland or the Congo, then I need more than facts. I need a miracle. And it is this miracle that we celebrate today in the liturgical season of Christmas. So John chapter number one, it says, in the beginning was the word. In the Greek, the word is logos. So in the beginning was the word, the mind, the wisdom of God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse number two, and the word was in the beginning with God. And I've substituted he and him for the word because there's a lot of he's in here and him's in here, and I want you to understand when the he is referring to the word or John the Baptist or the light so you can understand all the different descriptions at play in this particular text. And so verse number three, and all things came into being through the word. Somebody say the word. And without the word, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in the word was life. And the life was the light of all people. Amen. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Now, I can stop right there. We can have a good old preaching time, right? Because in this text, we see the activity of God being described as the word, being described as life, being described as light, being described as shining. If you are in a situation in your life and you need some wisdom, I'm here to tell you that the scripture says in the beginning, this wisdom, this word personified in the presence and person of God was active. If you need life, this scripture is telling us in the beginning, the life, the presence of God personified was present. If you need light, this scripture is saying in the beginning, before anything was created, all this was present with God and was God and is God. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to preach on that today. So verse number six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. You may be familiar with who this John. This John is not the writer of this text. This is John the Baptist. How I many I remember who John the Baptist was, right? John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, who if we were to go over into the synoptic gospels in the book, book of Luke, you would see that Jesus' cousin was uh, literally conceived by a barren woman named Elizabeth. Her, his father was Zacchaeus. I'm not Zacchaeus. It was Zacharias. I knew it was a Z and an A and a C in there, praise God. <laughs> Zacchaeus Zacharias is one of them. Zacchaeus climbed a tree. Mm -hmm. That's another message for another day. And literally, the cousin of Jesus came onto the scene in this verse, described, listen, that John came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. John himself was not the light, but John came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. So what's super amazing about this that could be relevant for us if I was gonna preach this particular text is that John came as a witness 
Which is just to say that all of us are being invited to bear witness. To not get ourselves confused with being the light. We're here to bear witness of the light. And I think that's important because there's a lot of folk with a God complex in the world today. And folks think that they literally are God, but I want you to know heavy is the crown for the one who is God. I mean, you know, can you imagine how hard it would be to be God right now? Forget everything that's happening in the world. Just think of your own life. How many of us have been struggling to be God in our own life? And it's kind of falling short. Not saying your life's a mess, although it is. I'm just saying that. <laughs> it's kind of, hmm. Right? And so there is indeed this sense that we are to bear witness to the light. All right, verse number nine, we're getting closer to the passage we're going to preach. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world, and the word was in the world. And the world came into being through the word, yet the world did not know the word. The word came to what was the word's own, and the word's own people did not accept the word. But to all who received the word, who believed in the word's name, the word gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Now, this is what we're going to preach today. Verse number 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Ooh, a lot of scripture for a Christmas Sunday service, but it was good to me. Somebody say amen. 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 The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. We're going to preach on the topic, continuing our theme about Christmas amidst the rubble. We're going to wrap up this series with the sermon today, Christ amidst the rubble. Let us pray and ask the blessings of the Lord on our time of preaching. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you, O oh God, to send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word today. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. amen. Christ amidst the rubble. On the screen, you see this artwork that literally has uh, become a powerful, powerful holding space for what is happening in Bethlehem. This artwork that serves as the backdrop for uh, this sermon today was commissioned by a good friend of ours named Shane Claiborne, the artist. His name is Kelly Lattimore. And they have created uh, this particular print to help raise money for the Christian churches in Bethlehem that literally canceled Christmas because, first of all, it was not safe for them to gather giving the bombardments and the aggression of the occupational forces in Bethlehem. Again, Bethlehem is not in Gaza, so Bethlehem is literally not a part of where Hamas is supposed to be. Bethlehem is much more in, you know, perhaps 90 miles or so away, perhaps more when I was there. Uh, I literally stayed in a hotel in Bethlehem and a few other uh, camps with some families. And, and so I remember one morning waking up to the bells of Palestinian Christians going to church on a Sunday morning in buildings that were literally over a thousand years old. And one of the Palestinian pastors there would just remind me that before uh, the church started in America, we were already here. That before you all uh, started worshiping God 
uh, in English, we were worshiping uh, Jesus and God in our native tongue. Before you all demonize the word Allah, that's how we pray, because that literally is the word for, uh, for God in our language. I mean, you know, he was just blowing my mind the whole time. And it, it really caused me to think about this contradiction of how can we, an outgrowth of the church that sprung up in this holy space, be continuing to celebrate Christmas while they are literally living in rubble. And it caused me, and if you've been here the last few weeks, you know we've been preaching a variation of this theme, and, and I hope to bring it all together and wrap it all up, because while there indeed is rubble in Bethlehem, there is also rubble in the Bay Area. There's rubble in the United States of America. There's rubble in our own lives. There are places and spaces that require us to be people who can reflect about what kind of Christmas must we have in a time where war, violence, lack, depression, isolation, harm, exclusion seem to be baked into the Christmas that we celebrate in Western culture. I mean, if you think about the, the kickoff of what historically has been the Christmas season, it usually is Black Friday. You know, you remember Black Friday before uh, it all became online, praise God. Now some of us got Black Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You just got a whole four-week cycle of a one day of excess where people will literally, I'm not hating on you if you, st you know, stood out all night long to get a fake markdown TV. Somebody say amen. <laughs> But that literally has historically been the kickoff of the holiday season. That in the West, it is not reflection, it is expenditures. In the West, it is virtue signaling, it is not sitting with the virtues. In the West, it is reinforcing our own kind of commercialization and not thinking about to what end are we being formed. And so this season, I believe, becomes a gift to us because it offers to you and I an opportunity to be reminded that while we may not literally cancel Christmas in all of its forms as they were compelled to do in Bethlehem, I want to invite us to think about what does it mean to cancel the kind of Christmas that keeps you and I from being reflective about the hope we need in the world? What kind of Christmas are you and I willing to cancel that keeps us from being able to embrace the peace we are to be in the world? What kind of Christmas are you and I willing to cancel that causes us to figure out how can I literally grab joy and cultivate it in this world? And dare I say, what kind of Christmas needs to be canceled that keeps me from being loved? in the world? I want to argue to you, child of God, that one of the great gifts of Christmas best defined is not something that happens from the external to the inward, but it is in its greatest form modeling the paradigmatic expression of God literally coming into the world and changing the world from the inside out. Lord, I, I wish I, I, I had a few of us who could fully appreciate how God perhaps has strategically positioned some of us in your circumstances, in your families, in your communities, even in the troubles of your own life, to not wait for something external 
to transform you or your circumstances, but God is saying, I placed you strategically in spaces and places and in the rubble of economic pressures, God says, I'm there to show up with you. In the rubbles of broken and fractured relationships, God says, I'm here to show up with you. In the rubble of desperation, in the rubble of irrational anger, God says, I'm here to show up with you. And if God is willing to show up with you, child of God, I believe that it should give you a little sense uh, of a reimagination around what it means then to receive a gift and what it means for you to be a gift. Lord, have mercy. Amen. How many know that there's some gifts you can't get by standing outside of Best Buy all night? Mm-hmm. There's some gifts you can't get by going, you know, to Harvard and going to Berkeley. No, no, no hate on Berkeley or Stanford or wherever. Some gifts only you can get from God literally saying that I am Emmanuel and I am here with you. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God is with me. Amen. And then, and so this then becomes the, the first point. I got three points and then we're going to, going to head on out of here. But the first point that I want you to appreciate coming from the text, verse number 14, the scripture says, and the word became flesh. If you want to fully appreciate what it means for this idea of God, of Christ to be found amidst the rubble, you need to first embrace this idea that God becomes us. Yeah. Somebody holler, God becomes us. Now, 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 Athanasius, he was one of the early church fathers. He was an African church father. They called him the black dwarf because he was dark and he was short. He, he, he was a theologian and a bishop in the fourth century, and I love his incarnational theology. The incarnation just means that God became flesh. Literally, what we read in verse number 14, and the scripture says it like this, that God, the word, became flesh. Athanasius says it like this, that Christ became human, so we can become divine. You ought, to, you ought to holler that Christ became human so we can become divine. This incarnational theology is a gift for us. Why? Because the theological phrase is called divinization, which just means that there's something ordinary about how we are created as an extension of the divine. But when Christ became human, Christ unlocked another step of our transformation to become like God. Now, I want you to know, becoming like God is not becoming God. Mm hmm. And that's important again because, you know, if you were God, that means you would be everywhere at the same time. That means you would never get tired. Some of you are like, that just cancels me out right now. Amen. Because I'm tired right now. You've been talking for 10 minutes. I'm tired. Amen. You just wish we could hurry up, Pastor Mike. That just shows that you're not God. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him I'm glad you're not God. Amen. Because, because if you was God, you'd be tired of my situation. Mm -hmm. You'd be tired of my drama. You'd be tired of all of my mess ups. But because you are not God, that means that the one who is God has the power to, to, you know, bear with me a little while. Anybody glad that God does not get tired of you? Well, some of you may have been lied to. Some of you may have been told that God is tired of you. That God is through with you. That God is rejecting you. That you are not enough. That you are a problem. I want you to know that anyone who tries to tell you that you are a problem to God is actually creating God in their own image. <laughs> because child of God, how can you be a problem to the one that created you? Oof. Lord, have mercy. I got children. We got two of them, praise God. And, you know, uh, you know they, 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 they get on my nerves. Mm -hmm. they, they stretch my patience. Mm -hmm. But they come from us. So there is never a moment where I regret them being here. 
There is, and I'm just a, 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 a incomplete, fractured father. But if I, with all my fracturing, can can fully hold and embrace that which came from me, imagine the unlimited, the uneffable God who created you. There's nothing you can do. That could make God get tired of you. Why? Because the scripture says God becomes us. God steps down into the divinization process and God gives you a pathway to become like God. God says, I love these folks so much, I'm going to give you a process. Through the power of the spirit, the same spirit that allows God to become flesh is the same spirit that allows human beings to become like God. And God says what? I will allow you to take on my characteristics, my nature, the things that God loves you now start to love, which is why I want to critique us in the Western church. How can we be so Christian and so convinced that we are the most enlightened Christians in all of the world? And yet we are, as Dr. King says, the greatest exporters of violence in the world. There's something wrong with the discipleship process of the Western church. How is it that we can claim to serve the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills? Owns everything. And yet we are so materialistically driven and formed by capitalistic forces. Never having enough, always wanting more. These are not the characteristics of those who are becoming like God. And so I have a question for you, beloved. If God becomes like us, what is keeping us from becoming like God? And again, God becomes like us as an act of extensive generosity and love. It is an abundant pouring out. It is not a deficit. It is in response to God's love. God says, I will become flesh. The holy arrival changes everything. God becomes flesh, but the flesh does not stay the same. The flesh becomes God and human to the glory of the eternal, and I want to ask you, beloved, what is keeping the church of Christ from becoming like Christ? This is such an important point, I believe, given all the many ways that the church in America, in the West, is overly identifying itself with Christian nationalism with the Make America Great Again movement, with the patriotism that leads to imperialism, with the excessive forces of capitalism that create all the conditions that many of us literally grit our teeth and put our head down and try to push through. Can you imagine what it would look like if every follower of Jesus in America said that because God became human, I am going to now put on the God-like characteristics of the divine. It means that some of our lives would have to radically shift. And is not this the point of Christmas? That Jesus shows up to save the world from their sins. If Christ If God becomes like us, the second thing that I love about this text is that it says that, verse number 14, and Christ lived among us. So it's not just that God becomes like us, but also Christ lives among us. So it's one thing to be an 
imitation or a reflection or a mimic of me, but it's another thing to live where I live. Anybody ever heard the phrase? Well, I'll say it like this. Uh, I, I remember being at Lake Merritt. I said Lake Merritt? Yeah, Lake Merritt. And it was a, a big old festival, and, and there was a brother walking through there. You know, he was, you know, certainly uh, intoxicated with various spirits, praise God. Could have been the purple, could have been the booze, could have been all what it could have been a mixture. But he was saying something so profound. He was walking around and he was singing. And he said, they love everything about me but me. He just kept walking around. He was just hollering, you know, different octaves and keys, rhythms. But after like the 20th time, you know, because, you know, sometimes you just block people. I was like, oh, Lord, I came for something different. And, man, you reminded me that I'm still here. So I say, man. But after the 20th time, I, I listened to what he said. They love everything about me but me. And it made me think about how people love to mimic the parts of you that they like, but reject the parts of you that they don't like. As if you can have one without the other. How many of you know it is the growing edge that actually makes me shine the most? It is the, 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 the part of me that I struggle with the most that actually gives me the most strength. And so God becoming like us is certainly one great gift of this season, but also appreciating that God doesn't just become like us, but God actually lives where we live. God is not a gentrifier, amen, where God is going to move in and kick you out. Because God don't like certain parts of you know, wherever you are, however you are, the scripture says that Christ lived among us, which is to say that there is never a circumstance where God is not at home in your life. There is never a struggle where God does not find God's self at home with you. And this is one of the most important parts of this Christian uh, Christmas celebration. Again, after nation says it like this, that what Christ did not assume would not be redeemed. Which just means that Christ did not assume, if Christ did not assume our humanity, then our humanity would not be redeemed. Now, it's important to appreciate that, that this is not to suggest that the power of God to redeem us is limited in any way. But it is to reinforce that the possibility and intentionality of God's desire to be at home among us among our rubble and among the mess of our lives, God says, I choose to show up where you are, not waiting for you to become what you will be. That God says that, that I will be where you are. You can be in depression. God says, I'll be there. You could be incarcerated. God says, I'll be there. You could be homeless or unhoused. God says, I'll be there. You could be in a war-torn country. God says, I will be there. You can be living in luxury. God says, I'll be there. You could be living by yourself or with somebody else. And God says, I will be there. Why? Because God says, I will assume wherever you are so I could do a switcheroonie and start to redeem wherever you are. Do you understand what it means to be redeemed? It means means that something that does not have value automatically is deemed valuable. There's all kind of, uh, uh, of, of, of great conversations happening right now about who will be the MVP of the National Football League. Uh, and they're saying, you know, Brock Purdy, you know, the San Francisco 49ers starting quarterback uh, who's only lost three games in the whole year plus that he's played. Uh, they're saying, oh, he certainly cannot be the MVP because there's too many good players around him. Uh, but I began to think about what does it mean for you to be a part of a team that has so much good talent on it that it diminishes your talent. Uh, well, I found that God is not intimidated by a team with no talent. Uh, God says, I like to show up with those who have been the rejected, uh, with those who are deemed the underdog, uh, with those who feel like they have been outcast. Uh, why? Because I like to live
live among these circumstances. Uh, in these circumstances, God says, I start to assume, I start to adopt, I start to absorb all the things that others say would literally cancel you out. God says, I want to assume that. Uh, I want to integrate that. Uh, I want to take that part of you that others say are a disqualifier and God says I want to begin to infuse that with some things that I know you will need uh, in order to make it through this next season of your life. Uh, are you with me today? God says uh, that I want to come where hope is needed. Uh, why? So I can assume and absorb the hopelessness uh, and literally inject it with holy hope. Somebody holler holy hope. Uh, God says I want to come uh, where there is no peace, uh, where there is war and violent situations among you. Uh, and God says I am able to redeem it uh, with blessing Blessed peace. Somebody holler, blessed peace. Uh, God says, I want to show up where joy is absent. Uh, and I, in the midst of grief and sorrow, uh, can redeem that and turn it into unspeakable joy. Somebody holler, unspeakable joy. Uh, God says, I want to come where love has left uh, and where hatred and exclusion seems to be sprouting up. Uh, and in its place, I want to create unconditional love uh, that covers a multitude of sin. Somebody holler unconditional love. Uh, so God is literally saying uh, that despair uh, when assumed by Christ becomes hope. Uh, that grief when adopted by Christ becomes joy. Uh, that hatred when absorbed by Christ becomes love. Uh, and war and violence when Christ shows up, Christ begins to exhibit peace. Uh, and I want you to know, child of God, uh, that the only way that Christ can become uh, what needs to be a reality uh, is when the church shows up as the footprint of God in the world. Uh, I know some of you are saying, how can we get despair turned into hope? Uh, how can we get grief into joy? Uh, how can we get hatred into love? Uh, how can we get war into peace? Uh, this is why we need to cancel Christmas. Uh, a Christmas that leaves everything the way it is. Uh, we got to cancel that kind of Christmas uh, that does not have in its mind that does not have in its eyes that I need to be a Christmas where the word can be made flesh. I need to be a Christmas where where there is despair, I show up and I become a walking, living, breathing force of hope. I need to be a Christmas where there is war and violence. I show up as an agent of peace and I stop by to tell you that when enough of Jesus people start showing up as an agent of peace as an agent of hope as an agent of joy as an agent of love there ain't no devil in hell ain't no devil in the White House ain't no devil at City Hall ain't no devil at the governor's mansion ain't no devil in another country can stop the power of peace, love, joy, and hope. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is why I want to ask you today, can you find Christ in the midst of your rubble? Can you look with eyes of faith and say, I don't see nothing but burning buildings, but broken bricks, but I can look real hard and I can see Jesus uh, laying right there with me uh, telling me that it's going to be all right uh, that weeping may endure for a night uh, but joy uh, it's coming in the morning uh, peace uh, it's coming real soon uh, power uh, is within our grief this is Christmas uh, somebody shout hallelujah And this is the power of a Christmas 
that literally takes seriously what miracles can do. The same spirit that makes Christ flesh is the same spirit that makes us divine in hellish conditions. We may not be able to solve it all, but we can determine how we show up. Remember, John the Baptist was not coming to be the light. He was coming to bear witness to the light. Our job in the story is not to be Jesus. Our job is to be John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mary and Martha. You're to be the disciple that bears witness. We've done so much work in justice and organizing, and I often have people say, Pastor Mike, how do you keep going? I said, barely by the skin of my chinny chin chin. <laughs> I've been told no more than I've been told yes. But I learned very early on that the results are an enemy of the process. Amen. We can be overly preoccupied with the result and not appreciate that the process is actually what transforms us the most. We ought to be people of peace. Not because we think our witness is going to bring peace to the world. We ought to be people of peace because being a person of peace works out the violence in your own life. We ought to be people of love, not because we think me just loving my enemy means that all my enemies are going to dissipate. It just means that literally you are massaging out the hate that unfortunately takes too much root in our lives. You ought to be hope, you ought to be joy, not because you think that your single act of faithfulness is going to radically change the world, but it is bearing witness to the activity of God in us. And can you imagine if all of us became like God while God is making us more divine. Stand with me then. Let's take a few moments and pray. Oh, it is Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. Old school song. It is Jesus in my soul. In my soul. For I have touched. For I have touched. someone we're gonna sing it one more time oh it is Jesus yes it is Jesus it is Jesus in my soul for I have touched say for I have touched the hem of his garb and his blood has made me whole and his blood has made me whole God I pray for the person I'm touching today someone Lord who needs to have a Christmas that is authentically reflective of you the you that is the glory of the one who is the creator of all. I pray God that in the midst of all that is happening in the world, that we would be a people who are characterized by peace in the midst of war, by joy in the midst of sorrow, by hope in the midst of despair, 
by love in the midst of hatred. And so I'm praying for my beloved right now that I'm touching. I'm praying for them because God, only you know the needs of their heart, the needs in their life. You know the struggles that they carry even into this penultimate day of Christmas. I pray, God, that you will break through, God, in an undeniable way that, Lord, you would literally become flesh in their circumstance. Lord, take root and take camp in their life. Lord, even if they never return to this building, I pray that the literal enfleshment, the incarnatability of your presence would be at work in them. Let them know, God, that you never tire of them. Let them know, God, that you are in love with them. Let them know, God, that you are at work in their life. And I pray in the name of Jesus that power will be unleashed. That healing will be unleashed. That hope will be unleashed. And I pray it will happen right now in the name of Jesus. Now lift your hands right where you're standing. Now, God, I want to pray for myself. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister, it is not my brother, but it's me, Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need you on this day, God, to remind me what the holy arrival really means. That it is bringing me peace. It is bringing me hope. It is bringing me joy. It is bringing me love. The kind of peace, hope, love, and joy that I can't buy online. That I can't get on sale at Target. That I can't purchase on a layaway plan. But God, it is something that arrives quick, fast, and in a hurry. So I receive it. Come on, I tell you, just by faith, reach up and grab whatever you need. I need hope today. I'm reaching up and I'm grabbing hope and abundance. I need love today. I'm reaching up and I'm grabbing love and abundance. I need joy today. I'm reaching up and I'm grabbing joy. I need power. I need healing. I need strength. I need love. I'm reaching up and I'm grabbing it today because I know God that you are giving it out in abundance. We thank you that you're amidst the rubble in our lives, that we can find you wherever we are, and that you are showing up to change us so we can indeed change the situations. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them I see Christ among your rubble. Tell them that I see Christ.